My name is uh, Samir Handa. I am the chairman of India New Zealand Business Council. I'm here based in Auckland. And good morning to our uh, attendees from India who are joining us. And good afternoon to people from New Zealand. And I think we have people from Singapore, Australia, and many other Asian countries who are joining us today as well. So welcome all. So this is one of the first webinars we are hosting on behalf of India New Zealand Business Council in collaboration with FICI of India. And we are very excited. And uh, the fact we have got a very strong panel of four very high caliber experienced speakers today, two from New Zealand, two from India. So the speakers today are gonna be uh, Mark from the Treasury of New Zealand, who's based in Singapore. Uh, Manish Singhal from FICI, India. Ralph Hayes, who is the Trade Commissioner of New Zealand based in Mumbai, but currently he's in uh, New Zealand. And Rohit Anand, who is a Country Manager for TCS based here in Wellington in New Zealand as well. So they will be joining us uh, shortly as well. So what we might do is, uh, for all the attendees, I would like to say a few things as uh, housekeeping. So when uh, the agenda briefly today is gonna be all the speakers, first we'll have a session where Mark and Manish will speak for five minutes each. And then we'll have a quick couple of questions from each, each of them. And then in the second session, Rohit and Ralph are gonna join us. And then after that, we will have a open session for questions for all four, the, four of the speakers. So that's how we're gonna go with the flow. Uh, housekeeping wise for all the attendees, if you can keep your microphones on uh, mute, please. So there's no disturbance while the panelists are speaking. And if you do have a question, which we encourage you to ask questions of the speakers, uh, you can use the tab Q&A at the bottom for writing your questions. And also you can mention which particular speaker you're asking that question from. And yeah, we'll take those questions after they have uh, done their speeches. So to start with, I would like to introduce uh, Mark a little bit more in detail. Mark Blackmore is joined us from Singapore. He is currently the treasurer senior rep for New Zealand government based in Singapore. He is in charge for Southeast Asia region. But before joining this role in 2018, he was also economic and financial advisor to the prime minister uh, here in New Zealand. And before that, he had some senior roles with Reserve Bank and Treasury as well. And Mr. Singla, I just found out he's my junior from my alumni, Delhi College of Engineering, <laughs> uh, joins us from Delhi. Um, Mr. Manish Singhal is a Deputy Secretary General of FICI. He's been there uh, with them since 2012, and he's responsible for uh, global outreach of FICI. He also oversees the Resource Conservation and Management, RCM, and FICI Quality Forum. Prior to FICI, he spent 22 years in many industries, may, many of them mainly automotive like Tata Motors, iShare, Escorts, and he has experience of working in over 60 countries on a multicultural businesses. So with that introduction, first I hand it over to you, Mark. Uh, please start with the discussion. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and hello and welcome to all the participants. Um, I hope you're all safe uh, and well in these uh, turbulent times. Um, I thought I would just provide a bit of an overview of how the New Zealand Treasury is seeing the world. Um, unfortunately, and particularly the New Zealand economy, unfortunately, that's not a particularly rosy picture, as I'm, I'm sure you all um, recognise. Um, New Zealand and India, along with most other countries in the, in the world, are face, is facing an unprecedented economic shock. There seems little doubt the global economy is now in recession. Um, but thankfully for both of our countries, we have so far avoided some of the worst health outcomes that are occurring in some other countries. There's obviously huge uncertainty about the outlook. And in the New Zealand case, we will likely experience its 
the largest ever quarterly fall in output in the current June quarter. Uh, I've seen some private sector commentators talking about the Indian economy contracting this year as well. And that would mean the lowest growth in over four decades. At least for New Zealand, this is looking like a, a one in a century event. So what's been the response and, and what are we trying to do to mitigate some of the uh, worst uh, outcomes of that? I think first and foremost, um, it has been to get control of and keep on top of the health situation. So to prevent COVID-19, getting set in the community and to prevent the health system being overwhelmed. Alongside this, and recognising the economic consequences of the enforced hibernation that the economy has been experiencing, has been to provide support to firms and households to help bridge the gap to a time when social interactions and economic activity can head back toward more normal conditions, whatever that new normal may look like 12, 18 months down the line. Both fiscal and monetary policy are being deployed aggressively. The government has provisioned $52 billion, uh, if necessary, to use for cushioning New Zealanders against the impact of the virus, positioning the economy for recovery and supporting the longer term recovery and any transitions that will flow from uh, dealing with COVID-19. The measures include direct support, increased transfers, grants, wages, wage subsidies, sorry, guarantees, liquidity support, regulatory change and forbearance. In this initial period of support, the goal is to contain the economic damage. If we can limit business failure and disruption, this will enable a faster recovery and reduce the longer run impact on people's material well-being and employment. These actions in some form or other are being mirrored elsewhere in the world, including in India. I think it's noteworthy that globally, the amount of fiscal and monetary resources being deployed uh, in response to COVID-19 is well in excess of what was done during the global financial crisis even if it appears uh, that this is largely the result of individual country initiatives rather than any particular collective leadership, for example, via the G7 or the G20. I think it's almost certain there's more to come. I think that's the case for New Zealand and elsewhere, uh, particularly as we're only now starting to really see the, the, the true fallout of the of the economic consequences of, of this hibernation or sudden stop. In New Zealand, the budget will be presented on 14 May and COVID-19 will be the focus, obviously. And the Reserve Bank Monetary Policy Committee will, will also be assessing its policy setting at its next meeting in May. Uh, I think it's likely we'll see uh, further initiatives, uh, both from the government and from the Reserve Bank uh, to support both this um, initial uh, period, but also uh, for recovery to get underway. The Treasury published a number of scenarios earlier in the month, outlining a range of different possible outcomes under different assumptions. These were inevitably high level uh, and crude, but they, I think they illustrated a, a few key points. Uh, and that's been reflected in the actions to date by the government. The first is that the alert level is crucial. Um, and that has implications for wanting to avoid sort of the yo-yoing between levels that um, uh, the government has talked about. Uh, given uh, the level of business curtailment that's present under each of the um, levels, uh, we want to avoid firms and households jumping in and out of those. But so the more we can transition in a steady but sustained way through those levels, uh, we think the better the economic outcomes will be. I think the second point the, the scenario has highlighted is that fiscal stimulus can mitigate some of the impacts. It won't remove them, uh, but it can soften the blow for households and for firms. 
Um, and the second is that it could, the third, sorry, criteria is that it could take, be some time before the economy gets back onto a pre-COVID path. Indeed, we may not recover all of the lost output in the meantime. In a different but complementary vein, we're also working hard to keep trade flowing between countries. And we're working with a number of others to promote the unhindered or as much as possible movement of goods, uh, and in particular, the goods, goods related to the health emergency. This has multiple dimensions, not least in keeping freight routes open and operating in light of the upheaval that has occurred in international aviation as a result of border closures. The other is to work hard against more trade restrictions being put in place. In both, in both fronts, we're, we want to work with like-minded countries. New Zealand as a small country can only do so much. We've also announced that we will unilaterally reduce tariffs on a number of medical goods uh, to support um, uh, the medical emergency in New Zealand. Um, I want to just leave you with some thoughts um, and interested in your views as, as much as uh, me talking. And that's what, what is the post-COVID world going to look like? What are the implications uh, for globalization um, uh, as a result of this crisis? What will be the role of government? Uh, as we intervene more, and things like industry structure, uh, there will be inevitably some winners and losers. So I'll leave it there and hand back to the chair. Uh, thank you, Mark, for that. And I also send a reminder to all the attendees that this is a time you can start asking questions through Q&A tab you have at the bottom of your screen. We will ask questions of Mark a bit later on. But now at this stage, I would like to invite our next speaker, Mr. Manish Singhal from FIKI India. Uh, good morning, everyone in India, and good afternoon in New Zealand, Singapore. Uh, pleasure always to share a stage with one of my alumni from DC. Thanks for getting me here, Samir. <laughs> and of course, always a pleasure to work with INZBC. Uh, at FIKI, of course, we reach out to, uh, you know, we have almost 270 partners like INZBC, and we are right now reaching out on this subject. Just to set the tone as to what's uh, happening in India, uh, There is, uh, uh, there is uh, probably common problem of economic uh, of, of fallout of COVID, but what probably differs, I'm just loading the presentation. Yeah, so what probably differs in case of India? So this is a common story all across uh, the, 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 uh, the growth rates you are seeing are plummeting all across. India is no different. Of course, our own projection for this year currently, actually this is a week back, is about 1.9%. Uh, next year obviously is going to be bright because most of the countries will be growing on a smaller base. But uh, I think most of the figures for 2020 are likely to get worse for everybody. For India, as I was explaining, the situation um, uh, uh, looks slightly better in the sense that our growth rate curves are not that steep so far. But in terms of economic impact, it is the same story. In fact, in terms of business confidence, we are nearing the same lows uh, as we saw in uh, 2008, 2009. Uh, the growth rate also needs to be, the growth rate in COVID cases also needs to be seen in the perspective that India has a very different uh, healthcare uh, budget allocation. You know, uh, the healthcare expenditure as a percentage of GDP is just about 3.6%. Uh, and you can see it compares uh, nowhere uh, uh, with, the, with the Western world. Uh, at the same time, probably a little bit of advantage we have is that our population above the age of 65, 70 years is relatively smaller. So we have a young population, but that also means that a lower growth rate of economy means uh, much, much higher uh, unemployment among the aspiration, uh, aspirational youth in India. Supply, demand, financials are, of course, uh, uh, in doldrums like in all countries of the world. This is just a snapshot of a FIKI survey we did uh, with the industry. This, this survey is a repeat of what we did in March and about a week old. And as you can see that 
the impact on uh, companies operations over 72% say it is high to very high and likewise in terms of recovery uh, it's only the uh, uh, sectors which are treated as essential and uh, where spending is essential for the consumer those sectors are looking at bouncing back in 3 to 12 months but yeah aviation hospitality real estate and all i'm going to share later are in are in doldrums and obviously supply chain and uh, 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 you know changes in uh, uh, workplace uh, cha you know weakening of rupee weakening of demand all those things are common factors across the board cash flows of course is i think again a common problem and in india we are struggling all the more because uh, uh, there, there's a very large set of msmes uh, 63 million msmes uh, who support almost 130 million people so now that they are not getting paid and not getting loans easily uh, they are the ones who will take uh, a major impact of this covid uh, this is something which probably i would almost uh, 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 end with uh, this gives uh, at the bottom out of the slide of course all the major impact industries we all are aware but what we've analyzed based on our surveys is that e-commerce, online, personal health care, and education, media are the ones which will come bounce back first once the COVID situation settles down. Uh, then would follow telecom and utility services and elective health care and probably definitely pharmaceuticals. Uh, about a year is what uh, apparel industry, insurance, agriculture, Speciality chemicals, metals, mining, offline retail will take because this a lot of this is partly uh, discretionary spend. And of course, like I mentioned, real estate and consumer durables, restaurant, food services, logistics, uh, higher education and all. Uh, those are the ones. And, and of course, auto industry uh, besides uh, civil aviation are the ones which will take uh, more than a year to two years to get back on track. Uh, because obviously a lot of it is first of all discretionary and a lot of it will also depend on how fast the businesses get back on track. This is of course uh, some of the key policy things broadly what it covers is you know we are ending the second phase of our lockdown on uh, this Sunday so that would uh, make a total 40 days of lockdown and we are confident it's gonna get extended because you know whatever good work which has happened in terms of uh, managing the growth rate in the cases uh, that has to be sustained but the government has been very proactive in allowing not only essential services but services related to essential services there so the ITS telecom which is backbone and probably making all of us uh, talk today uh, all those are on even since the harvesting season is on in India the government has given a lot of support to agriculture sector in terms of farm machinery supply loans in terms of even after sales support for the farm machinery so the government has been very proactive and they've thought through as to how to support very very basic levels of uh, economic activity and like i said they've been flexible all through they've extended all the validities of all licenses permits all all policies which were expiring let's say between mid-march to uh, end may uh, as yet so we expect that most of this will probably further get extended till September so that the impact is lower. Just one point from this slide I'll highlight is that uh, uh, we've already announced a package of 1.7 trillion rupees, which is almost 1% uh, uh, of our GDP. And then there is a new package which is expected anytime now uh, to sustain the future in this COVID times. Uh, there's again a lot of tricky suggestions which again government has been proactive to look at. Uh, so far all these postponements of permits and validity have been extended for three months till about June end. But we are we've requested for six months extension till September like I mentioned. And the government's been very proactive. They're not being stubborn or anything about it. Uh, again a lot of uh, policy flexibility and regulatory reforms have been shown tax payment has been uh, made more flexible and deferred again by three months so far but uh, we are sure it will get extended till september yeah i mean this i think i've already mentioned uh, won't repeat yeah that's it that's it from me samir so this is a very broad outline as to what's happening in india 
and would welcome any questions at any stage. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Manish. Sorry for a little interruption here on the video. Uh, just a quick question for you to start with, uh, Manish. Uh, as yeah. most of the world is seeing, and there's been a lot of discussion going on about pulling out of China as far as the manufacturing is concerned, like Japan has already mm -hmm. announced that, and there may be some a similar thing happening with American companies. What is India doing to attract these companies to come to India as part of Make in India initiative by the Indian government? Are you seeing a lot of people queuing up to invest in India for manufacturing and moving away from China? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say we are, uh, we are seeing them queuing up as yet, but yes, we are cognizant of this opportunity. And uh, government has already started working with us very closely. Uh, only thing is, what I'm seeing is like, even for Japan, almost 90% of that funding of $2.2 billion is for moving back into Japan. So only $200 million or $223 million of support is to move to any other country. But you know, the way we look at it is that none of these governments will let the investment go wasted. So probably what we look at it is the requirements of China and East Asian markets will still stay in China. And uh, they can't afford to move all their production back to US or Japan or Korea because then the things become very expensive. So while the things become expensive, they can sell in the local market, but they won't be able to sell it to third countries from there. So the opportunity for India is really the expansion and the add-on production uh, where they would want to de-risk from China and have additional capacities in India so that they could not only supply to Indian market, but also to third countries around, especially Southeast Asia and Africa and maybe Latin America and all. So that's what we uh, see uh, to be happening and the government is working with us on that. Rather, we are working with the government on that. And next question is for you, Mark. I know you're based in Singapore where uh, things seemed were getting better, but uh, on the contrary, <laughs> they've gone <laughs> in the reverse uh, where uh, things have become more um, uh, descriptive at the moment. So what is the situation in Singapore uh, at the moment? And also if you can... Uh, highlight at the macro level what New Zealand government is doing uh, regarding uh, doing some uh, bilateral trade between India and New Zealand at a macro level? Uh, well, first, just on the um, situation here in Singapore, um, the government has extended its, its circuit breaker, uh, so-called circuit breaker, it's a lockdown to everybody else, um, to uh, early June. And that's reflecting the, the flare up that's occurred uh, in terms of migrant workers and the foreign worker dorms. Um, the government's working here, is working pretty um, hard to um, meet the needs of those workers, uh, and, but also to contain uh, any more widespread um, um, communication, community uh, transfer. Uh, that's obviously going to have an impact on um, the Singapore economy. Uh, private sector forecasters uh, and the Monetary Authority of Singapore um, earlier this week noted that growth could fall below uh, the government's official forecast of minus 1 to minus 4%. So uh, it's certainly having an impact in terms of um, domestic activity, food and beverage, uh, domestic services, uh, obviously anything to do with international tourism, etc., uh, bearing the brunt of um, curtailment and activity. Um, in terms of the broader New Zealand-India relationship and what's happening at a macro level, um, the government, alongside obviously the inevitable domestic focus in terms of supporting New Zealand firms, uh, is quite committed to uh, international trade in this in this world and is working hard with uh, whoever is willing to um, keep those uh, trade channels going. Uh, I know there's been a lot of discussion with countries in Southeast Asia and South Asia about how we do that and that's an ongoing uh, process. Uh, it's, government's also supporting through its fiscal package, um, 
some support for ongoing uh, um, keeping freight freight uh, routes open um, so that we continue to be able to sell goods around the world uh, and some of that will be uh, end up in India. Um, we're certainly also keen to continue receiving the imports that we have been um, over time. A lot of um, in pharmaceuticals, for instance, are sourced from India uh, and the government's been working quite hard to uh, keep those channels open and I'm sure Ralph will be able to talk to this a little bit later in terms of what's happening on the ground. Yeah, just one more question for you, Mark, um, which question is by Dave. He's asking that since New Zealand has been excessively dependent on China for both import and export, they being our number one trading partner, how is this unprecedented event going to have an impact on this trade dependency? Uh, that's, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I think, and New I don't think New Zealand will be unique in this. I think we will see firms uh, and perhaps governments are uh, uh, all reassessing uh, what this means for their supply chains, for the resilience of this, their supply chains. Um, I think um, we have been seeing some diversification over time. It's by product line, I suppose, we're more uh, narrowly focused, but I think uh, this will be result in firms, which ultimately will drive that, that, that country um, dependency, will drive um, where we go from here. But I think uh, firms will want to uh, be, build in more resilience into their supply lines, whether that brings things closer to home or brings uh, shares them out amongst a, a wider range of countries, I think. We'll see all of that. Right. Uh, Manish, there's a question for you from uh, audience. Yeah, as you mentioned, uh, Manish, that India may extend their uh, lockdown period even further. I guess the question is, what do you anticipate? When will be the start of the recovery or when this pandemic would be over from the India's perspective? So when they can see getting back to normal as far as the trade is concerned or more trade with New Zealand in particular? Yeah, see, current estimates, uh, uh, first of all, even if the uh, uh, lockdown gets uh, extended, which we expect, uh, that is largely to maintain the social distancing norms, but they are expected to open some more sectors of economy and maybe retail, like one of the states in India, Kerala's from today, you know, opened up even non-essential item shops with all the distancing norms being uh, uh, imposed. So we expect some more sectors of the economy to open up like they opened two weeks back, uh, last to last Monday, real estate, construction, uh, e-commerce and retail. A lot of it opened up and supply chain for all of them was totally freed up that no, no uh, trucks all will be stopped. We expect this to get expanded. Having said that, if the current rate of growth, uh, or let's say the uh, curtailed growth or the slower growth in the cases continues, uh, what it is felt is that by June, uh, 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 India would uh, definitely flatten the curve and we would open more. Maybe the curve might start, start flattening from early June. And so by June end, we'll be confident of opening up further. But exports are already on construction, real estate in non-containment areas are already on e-commerce, even maintenance services like for healthcare, you need companies to maintain the refrigeration, air conditioning and all the medical uh, devices and all that. So that's on. So that will further open up uh, even if the lockdown continues after Monday. Right, thanks Manish. At this stage, I may like to thank both Manish and Mark for the timing. Uh, there's a lot of questions still coming through which will take them uh, at the end of the session, but I think I need to move on to our second session of the day. So for this second session, I would like to introduce two new speakers. One is Ralph Hayes to talk to us from the New Zealand perspective. And the other one is Rohit to talk to us from the Indian industry perspective, the country manager for TCS. So briefly, if I like to introduce, uh, start with Ralph. Ralph is our trade commissioner for New Zealand 
and Council General based in Mumbai, where he is heading the New Zealand Trade and Enterprise Division, uh, both for South Asia, which includes Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Bhutan, besides India. Uh, Ralph has been with NZT for seven years now. And before, as part of that, he's been a trade commissioner in Sao Paulo and also business development manager based in Madrid in Spain. So he's fluent in Spanish and Portuguese, so we'll feel free to ask him questions in that <laughs> to test his knowledge. And interestingly, Ralph also has experience in airline and cruise industry, which are the two industries mostly affected around the world. So any questions around that for Ralph would be good. And then uh, moving on to Rohit Anand, who is the country manager for TCS. He's based here in Wellington in New Zealand. Uh, Rohit has been with TCS for 18 years. Uh, and before the joining TCS, he was country manager of Tech Mahindra. So with these brief introductions, I will uh, let Ralph start with his presentation and then we'll move to Rohit. Ralph, hand it over to you now. Hi, everyone. Um, so I thought I'd maybe give a bit of a perspective of what it's like on the ground for some of our New Zealand companies uh, since, that, since Mark and Manish have given a good overview of sort of the macro perspective here um, uh, in India. And as you know, the, uh, we're at the nationwide lockdown has been extended to 3rd of May, but on the 20th of April, uh, there was some um, partial um, opening of some of the lockdown restrictions, uh, which has made an impact. But I'll, I guess I'll start by talking through the dynamics. So in that first week of the lockdown, a lot of our companies um, were experiencing quite a lot of challenges in that supply chain dynamic um, and colleagues uh, from Maersk and DHL as their uh, uh, supply chain capacity reduced to maybe 10% of what it was in, uh, in normal times. Uh, key dynamics for that was challenge finding truck drivers in the early times um, and customs clearance offices and things like that. So that was a, a big challenge for our companies. So a lot of our first week or so of the COVID experience is around trying to help companies move products around. Um, that includes companies like Fish and Pike or Healthcare that were moving Atmia equipment around India, uh, fresh produce companies, uh, pharmaceutical companies, amongst others. Uh, then it moved along. Then I guess our, the, the following week, the experience was especially around the essential services and the dynamics of that, uh, understanding where, which com where, where the companies fall into an essential service or not. Uh, an example of this was, was Raycon, where their space and defense technology equipment, so they have an operation in Bangalore uh, with around about 650 people there. Uh, they, their defense and space technology uh, element of their business was able to open, uh, which was around 10% or so of their capacity. But their crystal oscillator manufacturing into the telecommunication industry uh, was not. So, the, you know, as, as that sort of partial opening of the economy, you know, there was, we, we supported those companies with trying to uh, get a release to then open up their to other capacity. Of course, there was always challenges around getting staff to the office. Um, and uh, especially with daily workers, daily wage workers, um, maybe returning to their villages to uh, tap into the safety net of their of their community. So that was the experience in the sort of essential services dynamic. Uh, then it was a number of then it was understanding there was the impact on different sectors. So uh, key sectors for us uh, in India are F and B fresh produce sector. Um, but of course, um, the lucky, luckily for us, they were seen as an essential services. So companies like Mr. Apples, Esprit, Golden Bay, Quality and Z and others uh, were still able to sell into uh, India. There were some challenges around supply chain and quarantine requirements of ships that may be coming through from China and other markets. Um, However, then, but within their, within their sector, there was the dynamics of the impact on the Horeca and uh, food service sector, and then the retail dynamic. And of course, those companies that were diversified across those two were, have fared better. So for example, Fonte Fonterra, who have their um, Font Dreamery range, which uses locally sourced uh, milk products selling into the retail sectors like Food Hall, uh, that continue, but of course there was the end, last mile uh, supply chain challenges they face with uh, shipping and, and trucking and movement of product around. 
However, their, their business, uh, the Anchor Range product that they sell into the hotel industry more or less dried up overnight. However, some of the hotels uh, have pivoted into using some of their, their dynamics in the, uh, from a retail perspective, so selling products through their retail um, offices uh, in that area. Um, another area, aviation, so at NZICPA has an agreement with uh, Indigo Airlines, of course, they had 25 student pilots ready to come to New Zealand to Wanganui to train and of course they've been delayed there or in lockdown here in New Zealand and of course they've had to pivot quite quickly towards online learning as they wait for the air corridors to open up for them to then move to between the markets to do the, the practical training. Um, pharmaceutical industry, there was some, we did get a lot of requests from, from government on companies like Pharmac with methadone and other products like that, where, as, as Mark alluded to earlier, that a lot of um, pharmaceutical products are sourced from India. And as a result, we were asked to try and identify some of the challenges. What is the key problem with that? And sometimes it could be, you know, lack of uh, people transport logistics. Others, other, another example was that key ingredients for certain pharmaceuticals that were sourced from China and China had stopped flying uh, shipping those uh, essential ingredients into pharmaceuticals since January and of course uh, the Indian pharmaceutical industries or manufacturers that then take those essential ingredients from China and combine it to then sell it globally uh, were under pressure so there was a whole lot of different dynamics we had to understand in that sort of space. Um, uh, that's probably it for us. I, I guess happy to take some questions. Uh, we've got a number of number of our companies. Some are doing quite well. So, for example, Fresco. A number of their inquiries has gone, grown exponentially as they get the dry powder food handling technology. Um, as companies look to pivot away from high labour operations to getting to more more auto, automotion, automate automate. Sorry, uh, more automotion into their into their activities, uh, and of course, uh, Fish and Paykel, healthcare, and other companies are seen as essential services have uh, uh, never been so busy. Uh, so that's sort of, I guess, a bit of a reflection of the experience we're seeing on the ground, um, and then working with our NZ Inc partners. Obviously, there's been extraction flights and some of the dynamics in that place. So I'll hand it back now, Samir, and happy to take questions. Yeah, thanks, Ralph. We'll uh, take the questions after uh, Rohit. So. <clears throat> I'll hand over to Rohit to start with, and then we'll take the questions for both of you. Thanks, thanks, Samir. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon and good morning to every one of you. Um, I hope you're all staying safe and well in this time of lockdown in both our countries, as also Singapore. Uh, and thank you to INZBC and Fiki for organizing this webinar on the economic impact. So thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd just like to start with my quick introduction. I've been in the New Zealand market for 15 years and I've been involved with trade between India and New Zealand. So, so I think um, it's quite challenging, but hopefully a time of a lot of opportunities for all of us as two nations who, who have held a lot of potential. Uh, now, quickly, uh, before I get to the point of what's the economic impact of this situation on and take Tata and TCS as the case study, I just want to quickly touch upon what we hold as a group, you know, and why this is relevant as a subset of Indian economy. Uh, Tata group, for all of you who may know, seven per, represents 7% of India's GDP. It's 66% owned by charitable trusts. It's got 800,000 people that work for it. Uh, it's the largest private sector employer in India and UK. And Tata products are consumed by 800 million Indians in one form or the other. And TCS, which is the technology business, is the third largest technology services business in the world with about half a million people that work for it globally. So the reason I mentioned those points is it, it adequately represents a subset of Indian economy, representing 7% of the GDP, like I said. Where are we at with this COVID-19 situation? Again, for anyone to say what's the real impact going to be, is going to be it, it, it is going to be hard to quantify it at this point in time. It's an evolving situation and, uh, and, 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 and only time will tell how long this goes. But what we're witnessing and what we have witnessed in the, in the past few weeks as Tata Group and as TCS 
are some very interesting uh, perspectives and what is our stated position and what is the impact and how do we see ourselves opening up post the lockdown some key metrics here so first of all as an organization as a we've decided there'll be no retrenchments in our organization for the foreseeable future which means at least one year um, we do notice a pause in demand by no means uh, elimination of demand we do see pause in demand globally and interestingly enough we see spike in demand from new zealand market as as uh, as interesting as it may sound to some of you now the reason for that spike in demand with some of the new zealand businesses who want to keep the lights on they really want to plug and play into organizations who have ability to ramp up and even for people to be working from home and to deliver the services seamlessly. So 90% of our half a million staff as a technology business have been working from home and quite seamlessly continuing to deliver our engagements. We do see a differing of decisions as far as travel, transportation and hospitality is concerned. That's a consistent uh, trend we've noticed, not just in New Zealand, but also globally. Just as of yesterday, um, over the last few weeks, the organization has made some very, very interesting announcements, which may be of interest to all of you. Now, as half a million people, like I said, who represent TCS as a technology business, we have as an organization witnessed 25% increase in productivity in the short time that the people have been working from home. So, which is quite interesting, and it has impact on, on the way we will operate, way we will come through even post the law. So the organization has um, announced that by, and it's a 25-25 strategy that we co we're calling it, by 2025, uh, we will move to a model where 75% of our workforce will continue to work from home and only 25% of our staff will be using offices. Now, now that could be a great insight and great um, lead up to some of the potential future that we may see as an organization or, or for other technology businesses around the world. So enabling businesses to go digital and agile, I think that's something we're seeing immense demand on. And I think once this situation improves a little bit, we will see that as an opportunity. Again, crisis we see as an opportunity. We've got 10 billion New Zealand dollars in cash as an organization, as technology business alone. So scouting for acquisitions to see how we can strengthen our portfolio. And we would like to play the channel and a conduit to New Zealand small, medium businesses and provide not just the market access, but potentially look at public private partnerships to provide foray into Indian market, which will ramp up the economic activity and cash in on the clean green image of New Zealand, look at areas like green tech and many other age care solutions, et cetera. So in summary, to wrap it up, we see short-term pause in demand in mobility and activity in general. We see public private partnerships coming through. Uh, I think uh, with the bureaucracy, uh, red tape being cut and, and I think more purpose-led businesses, we will see the advent of. Uh, New Zealand has a great opportunity to cash in on the positive perception image politically as also as a green economy. I think that will be a big plus for a market like India in terms of economic activity. And New Zealand small, small medium businesses in terms of getting a digital backbone and enhanced agility post this situation, I think will find opportunities in India hitherto unseen. So. So net-net, we see a lot of positives. We see new models emerging, some of it I alluded to. And, um, and, and, and I'll just like to wrap up with the quote of Charles Darwin, which says, it's not the strongest of the species or the most intelligent of species that will survive, but probably the most adaptable that will survive. So I think the situation is no different. COVID-19 presents an opportunity to India and New Zealand to look at new ways to engage and probably do business in a more meaningful, more purpose-led way and grow the economic activity once the situation stabilizes. So thank you. Uh, thanks, Rohit. Uh, just a quick question for you, Rohit. 
In uh, IT sector, since we have seen a big uh, increase on uh, the usage of technology and all that, which many people are saying, we are saying the, the future has come a little early. I mean, what we were planning on seeing in five years, we are seeing it today. So I know TCS is playing a big role in that, but what advantage we can take of that, not only for the current situation, but for the future, for both businesses in New Zealand and India? I think uh, one thing is very clear what 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 we would like to provide as a huge channel with market access is uh, is is play that conduit with values alignment and take some of the small medium businesses in New Zealand who may not have a very evolved and a very strong e-commerce or a digital backbone provide that channel in a very digitally enhanced way. So I think that will open up new markets, new opportunities, new sectors, which right now may be hard to imagine, but but there'll be new areas which we definitely see coming up. Thanks, uh, Rohit. Ralph, a question for you come from Siridhar of Creek HQ in uh, India. He's saying in this COVID downturn situation, what parameters do you advise for New Zealand businesses to take? India once was having a target of 5 trillion economy by 2025, but now with the downturn, the economic growth rates are different. What should New Zealand SMEs do to stay healthy in such global economic downturn situation? Well, I think uh, in India, there's still an opportunities and look, even you know, for the last year, we have seen companies looking to diversify out of China and you know, minimize their risk or you know, spread their risk across a number of different markets. I mean, and India still provides a lot of opportunity, especially for that scalability, um, you know, to provide scalability to go international. And we and most of the companies that we work with in India, a lot of them, you know, the majority of their products is actually sold into other markets from India. And it's well, it's a, you know, location is a, is a good thing. I think it's around, I mean, this is the time where it's around your partners. It's about selecting the right partners, um, and maybe not at this time to try and do it on your all on your own. Probably look at sort of evolutionary type business model where you tap into the expertise or resource of a local partner who can help with that last mile or help with understanding the bureaucracy dynamics. And then over time, it may be that as you as things change, you could then stand on your own two feet. Um, but for now, I think it's you know, be careful with your partners. And now is a good time to do a lot of that work around the agreements part of your business. Um, and you know, understand you, the product flows and things like that. But those companies that have a, a sophisticated or simple supply chain are the ones that are going to be able to relaunch or break into India a lot easier at this stage um, as we wait for things to settle down than maybe those with a sort of complex supply chain or they're relying on parts from various sources. Yeah, thanks for that, Ralph. Now, there are many questions which have come uh, and some of them having a same sort of theme. So I will just throw them to the whole panel now if anybody would like to answer. Uh, one of them being around education industry. Uh, as we know, it's been a big part of New Zealand economy, the education industry, and especially the flow of students coming into New Zealand for studies. How is this going to be affected? And what are we doing to... Um, what are we doing about it so this industry stays uh, healthy and strong for the New Zealand economy? Um, I think, um, obviously, yes. The, the, along with international aviation, international education is obviously one of the, the sectors that be most adversely affected. I think we will be seeing the institutions themselves think about the way they deliver um, their learning. Uh, I think this is an opportunity. Um, Ralph mentioned partners. I think this is that's potentially another uh, route that institutions um, may, in terms of delivering their education services, thinking about partners, partnering with other institutions. Uh, I mean, a, a lot obviously depends on when the borders start to open up and when uh, students can start to flow again, I think we may we may see things. Institutions, for instance, uh, facilitate quarantine periods um, um, for some courses. 
two, two weeks in quarantine is not a lot if it's a three-year course. So I think there are various ways that the institutions will um, uh, look to get through this, but I don't think we can shy away from the fact that there will be challenges in, involved for, uh, for quite some time. Uh, I think return to normal was um, some way down the track. Uh, thanks, Mark. There are a few other people asking a similar sort of question, saying since some of our uh, traditional or conventional industries are going to suffer in the new new world as we are seeing it, what are the new areas of business which will open up as a result of this pandemic? And uh, what are we doing about that uh, to work with each other from FICI and New Zealand's perspective? Any new industries are we pinpointing to work on? Just a couple of points from me. Some of the, the companies I'm seeing, Samir or everybody is, especially in that technology space. So companies like Velocity that do cloud-based uh, land valuation technology for, for the banking industry um, in India. They were part of um, Deputy Prime Minister's mission to India uh, in February. Um, and, and obviously, I think in, in extension to Mark's comments there around the online companies and that online learning technology, those that are, be able to scale that up uh, quickly and to provide that sort of student experience best are the ones that are going to be able to sort of capture a good part of that market. And I know some of the universities in India have been looking at some of the technology that New Zealand companies have in that space to look to see if they can, as we said earlier, around partnering to see if we can um, continue that student experience using some online learning technology. And, um, if I could just add to that, I think that's a very good point mentioned by Ralph. Um, and, and I think uh, we know 65% of Indian population is between 15 and 30 years of age. So if you look at the subset of it, the trainable, educatable market remains quite significant. In, scores of millions and i think that's a huge opportunity that we continue to see which technology and online learning platforms and new ways of imparting that education can provide between india and new zealand more specifically yep Th thanks for that and also as we have seen as a result of this situation we had our first direct flight to go from new zealand to india recently i think Ralph, you were on that one to come back to New Zealand. Yeah, I was on the one back from from Mumbai. Uh, we've we had we've got one today from Delhi, so that's we've had two evacuation flights from Delhi and one from from Mumbai. Yeah. Right. So I guess a couple of people have asked the question uh, just to make sure that people uh, or the audience understand that med services on both sides between New Zealand and India have been working very closely on this repatriation flights to make it happen, which had not happened earlier. So it's the first time we are seeing the direct flights happening between India and New Zealand. So that is an example of some new things coming out of this uh, situation. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, it was a great one one team effort, I suppose. There was a whole lot of different uh, players in there and, the, and I met service, especially around that uh, temperature level, you know, temperature at night. We had to sort of fuel at 2 a.m. in the morning to make sure the temperature levels were low enough to get as much fuel on as we can to get that 15-hour flight from India to New Zealand. So, yeah, that's the type of insights you need or technology you need to make these flights happen. Perfect. Excellent. Hey, I, I think we still have a lot of questions which we will have to forward them to you guys to probably come back with the replies. We'll have to reply them back by email. So I think we're running short of time now. So what I would like to do towards the end is ask each one of you to give your uh, parting remarks or give us uh, your thoughts for a minute each. So we'll start in the same order we started. So I'll start with Mark first. Mark. Uh, thank you, Samir. Um, I think it's probably worth leaving on a, a, um, a positive note. I, I think, I mean, there's no doubt that the shock that we're all experiencing is large uh, and will have some long lasting um, effects on, on firms and in households. Um, uh, and we can't get away from that. We need to acknowledge that. I'm hopeful though that the, um, through countries working together and the aggressive nature of the policy responses that 
uh, governments, uh, both India and New Zealand, have put in place that we have avoided the, uh, the truly bad outcomes that could have been on the horizon. Um, uh, as Rohit mentioned, though, um, we can't be absolutely confident in our predictions, but I'm hopeful that that's the case. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Manish, final well, word? Uh, nothing more, of course. Uh, I'll welcome any questions offline. Uh, you know, you can send them to Gaurav and me. But probably just one parting note, I think we should take this opportunity to salute all our frontline warriors in this fight. You know, our healthcare professionals, sanitation staff, plus, of course, security people, both, both the armed forces and the uh, civil security. And I would say to a certain extent, media also because you know, they are keeping us abreast as to what's happening around the world. And they too shared some part of this risk. So that's all from me today. Thanks, Manish. Over to you, Ralph. Yeah, so quickly for me, as the others suggested, look, the India is a big opportunity um, and the, the, the demographics and the age of the population lend itself to you know, a future economic powerhouse. And I think our companies can see that. Um, you know, the challenges we have is that those companies, you know, at this stage probably have to have a bit of, I say the three P's, patience, persistence and perseverance. But once they get get in and get established, then, um, you know, the, the sky's the limit. Um, and we've, I mean, from an NZT perspective last year, we had record results uh, for our companies in India, which is a good sign going forward. Just a quick note on Expo 2020, what's happening in uh, Dubai if, uh, for people's information, Ralph? Okay, so that's now gone off to Paris for a vote to on whether that's uh, delayed for another year. Um, I know New Zealand's on the executive panel for that vote and they have to have the two thirds majority. So uh, at the moment, we're still waiting on the, the finalization of that vote, but as far as I know, it's, it's probably likely a bit like the Olympics dynamic, I guess. If I, may, if I may interject, I think the Expo 2020, they've announced the new dates. It's yep. 1st October onwards in 2021. Uh, till till mid of March, 2022. Okay, thanks, Manish. Yeah, I knew it was any time now. Excellent. Okay, over to you, Rohit. Thank you. Um, just to wrap up, um, I think um, as as um, gloomy as it sounds at the moment, and as it looks uncharted territory for all of us, but do believe very strongly believe that the human resilience will survive and we will all come through it stronger. Uh, India-New Zealand trade has, has traditionally not performed to the potential that we've all seen. Uh, I think this could provide an opportunity for that trade potential to be realized better than any other time we've seen in history. Um, we do feel, I personally feel, health, wellness, education, um, technology, and food will remain sort of industries which will opportunities between India and New Zealand. Oh, yes, sir. And, um, and I, think, I think we should probably all be optimistic and hope for these things to pass very, very soon. Thank you. Thanks. All right, with this, I take the opportunity to thank all of our speakers today. Thank you all for your contribution on the discussion, the topic, which is very relevant uh, at, the, at these times. And I think we both in India and New Zealand are fortunate in the sense we got a great leadership shown by our Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern here in New Zealand and Mr. Narendra Modi in India, how they are trying to control this pandemic situation in the respective countries. So hopefully we will come out of it sooner than the rest of the world and we'll start trading with each other. So with that note, I'd like to say goodbye to you all and we'll continue these webinars every fortnight. So keep tuned in. Thank you very much. Thank you all.